All righty, well, let's jump into this this morning. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have again to come into your presence and worship you, Father, particularly on this weekend that we celebrate our freedom as a nation. And Father, today as we talk about our freedom in you, that you just would be here today and you would be magnified and glorified in all that we say and do. And, uh, and as we leave today, Father, we know that we will know that it's been good to be in your presence. And we thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. You can probably turn that off completely then, Zach, if, you, if it's not already. That's probably where it's coming from. Is that better? Yep, that's better. Thank you, sir. Awesome, awesome. All right, well, let's jump into this this morning. So naturally, I've been thinking about this word freedom as we celebrate our freedom and our independence you know, I'm, I'm reminded, too, every one of these July 4th weekends and celebrations that, you know, the day we celebrate was just the beginning of it. That was just the day they declared their freedom. Isn't that interesting? They declared July the 4th as that 1776 of our Declaration of Independence, but there was a lot, of, there was a lot that happened after that. It was, a, it was roughly, you know, quite a few years from the moment that happened. In fact, if you look at the lives of all those who signed the Declaration of Independence, most of those that pinned their name to that document suffered greatly in the days and years to come. I mean, lost fortunes, some died in battle, some lost their, 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 their children in battle, and it was, you know, they, they paid a price for that. And, and you had to know on the onslaught, and we, you know, we can look at the painting, the historical painting of when that moment happened, and it's really neat. But they had to know in their minds that they were going to have to pay a heavy price for, the, for signing their name, pinning their name. They were targeted by England, and they were considered traitors. I mean, all that they went through, all that had to happen for us to have freedom. So they declared it, but then what they declared actually had to be won. Isn't that interesting? What they declared literally had to be won. It had to be bought and paid for. And, uh, and, I, and I compare that in parallel to, to our Christian faith. You know, our, our independence, and this is beautiful for us, our independence was bought and paid for before we were ever born. Isn't that amazing? We just have to live in that area. Now, you know, pre-Jesus in the A.D. versus the B.C., right? Uh, or, or in the B.C. versus the A.D., I got that backwards, uh, you know, it, it hadn't happened yet. But for us, thank God, we, we, we've been born in an era where our freedom and our liberty has been bought and is paid for. Now, the difference between that and reality is someone knowing the difference, knowing it. And that's called the good news. And, and, and the good news really isn't good to someone that doesn't know it yet. But when someone knows about the good news and they've received that good news, that's, that's the game changer. That's when it happens. Y'all, is anybody hearing a ring besides me? I'm hearing a slight ring. Anybody hearing it? As long as y'all are not hearing it. Is everybody comfortable? See, I bumped the AC way down one Sunday. Y'all remember that? I like to froze y'all because I'm hot up here. So I don't mind being hot as long as y'all are comfy. Good. All right, well, let's take a look this morning. I want us to look at a story, and it's found in John chapter 8. And I've got a headline verse, and I'm going to save that. I've got a, a main verse we're going to go to, but we're going to save that because I think that in context with this story will really make it make sense. This story is found in John chapter 8, verse 11, first 11 verses. And it's a familiar story to you. Uh, you're, you're going to be familiar with this. Let's begin reading here in verse number 1. It says, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but earlier the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus. This woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says that we must stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, and he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he, stood down, then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. And then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them, one of them condemn you? 
And she replied, No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. So three quick points right here. And I just got a feeling we're not going to be here long. So, see, you, he laughed. Is that terrible? He just laughed at that. You know what I mean? I'm laughing too on the inside. So three quick points I want us to see in this story. This is a powerful story, but the first thing that really comes to my mind is this, and that is that the devil, the devil, and those teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, they didn't care one thing about this woman at all, but Jesus cared deeply for her. Isn't that interesting? Like, they, like they, they've caught her. They don't, they don't care about her. They don't give a flip about her. The devil doesn't care about her. They're just using her to get to Jesus. Isn't that interesting? And they, they don't care about her whatsoever. Now, keep in mind, these are the religious leaders and the Pharisees who are teachers of the law. They should be the shepherds of the flock and the people that should care most about people and sinners. But yet they care absolutely nothing about her whatsoever. And, of course, the devil, her adversary, is behind that. And I, I, I don't know for whatever reason, when I think about this story, and maybe you relate to me, there, there's, a, there's something that jumped out at me as I read this, and that is the crowd. The crowd. When I think of this story, and if you've seen maybe a video or, or, a, or a, you know, a film about this, this, this particular moment... I've never really seen it with the crowds in it. And even in my mind, I don't picture the crowds. I just picture Jesus standing there, sitting there, and they just bringing the woman and throwing the woman at his feet. But, 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 but it says more than once, there's a multitude of people. There's a massive crowd of people that had come to hear Jesus teach. And this, these, this crowd of people were all standing around. I don't know how big the crowd was, but it could have been from 100 to... 10,000, 5,000, who knows? I mean, you know, we know that he garnered that kind of crowd on the, on, on the banks of the, the Sea of Galilee, but I'm sure if it was a crowd, it was a crowd. And can you imagine, listen to this, can you imagine the shame and the humiliation that this woman must have felt in that moment? Now, we're not talking about her guilt or not guilt. It's obvious that no one's refuting her guilt, right? No one's trying to defend her guilt. She was caught in the act of adultery, so that is what it is. But can you imagine that, though? Can you just put yourself in her shoes for a moment? That even if she was, uh, can you imagine the sheer humiliation and embarrassment she must have felt in that moment? Not, you know, hey, it was enough to be thrown in front of Jesus, but for all that to happen in front of this crowd of people. I want to say big crowd. I think it was a big crowd. I'm sure it was a big crowd. Can you imagine the shame and the humiliation that she must have felt? They cared absolutely nothing about her. They cared nothing about her, but Jesus did. He cared for her deeply. And I think about this. Now, again, who were these people? These were teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees. And I think about that in comparison to the law. You know that the law doesn't care anything about you? The law, like from the Ten Commandments, and that's really for us it, the Big Ten. I mean, the Levitical law and the Hebraic law, we've never really had to follow. I mean, it's there. It's just as important as the Ten Commandments to the Hebrews and the Jews. But we, we've, we've, we've given ourselves a pass on that, and we've never really expected ourselves to follow that. We've just focused on the Big Ten. But even the Big Ten, listen, you know what? They're as hard as stone. And the law itself cares nothing about us. It has no feeling. The law is just the law. In fact, if you look at Lady Justice, the statues, and I can't say it's quite that way because it just depends on who you are, many circumstances, and, and your status as to why this person gets in trouble and this person doesn't. But Lady Justice has blindfolds on her as she holds the scales because the law is supposed to be blind and the law is supposed, is supposed to not care or give any account to one's plight or one's situation, that it's supposed to be equal justice under the law. And so the law is supposed to be unbending, hard, written on tablets of stone. And so the law in itself has no feeling. And these teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees, they represent that well. And they had no care for this woman whatsoever. And, and here's the next part. And they had no ability, and this is not in my notes, but they had no ability to bring any change to her life either. All they could do, 
and this is a picture of the law in flesh, in the flesh, all they could simply do was point out her failures and her mistakes. That's all that those representatives of the law could do, was point out her failures and mistakes. And in reality, that's the only thing the law can do for you and me, is point out our weaknesses, our failures, and our mistakes. Isn't that interesting? Listen, and Jesus, and this is so important, it's, it's, it's why it's so important that when we read Scripture, we take it in context, and we, 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 we understand who's saying it, and what they're saying it about, who they're saying it to. Jesus brings this law just to show you that the law is unbending and it has no real feeling. Jesus brings the law to the height of a pristine standard. And he brings it to a place where he says, if you even think it in your heart, you're guilty. Isn't that amazing? Listen, he brought that analogy when it comes to murder and adultery. He said, if you just think it in your heart, you're guilty. And that's not written in the law. But Jesus is bringing, now that's not our standard. There's also a standard that says, you know, if, if, if your eye offends, you pluck it out. If your arm offends, you pluck it out. And people that are really big on the law have never seen anyone with plucked out eyes or cut off wrists or hands. But that is the standard. And that's the standard that Jesus himself set. Isn't that interesting? And you know what that standard is? That standard is real, but it's hard and it's cold and it does not care for you at all. Listen, and could do nothing to help you whatsoever. And that's exactly where this lady found herself. I titled this little, this little title above this scripture reading, She Needed Freedom. She Needed Freedom. She Needed Freedom. Now listen, she needed freedom. Now why was she caught in that situation? Because more than likely she was a prostitute. In fact, many scholars believe that this was Mary, the sister of Lazarus, and that, that Jesus cast seven demons out of her. And she being the one that, that burst into the room where Jesus was seating and reclined at the dinner table with the Pharisees, and she broke open her alabaster box and anointed Jesus' feet with that costly perfume and spikenard and, and, and washed his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. And the Pharisees are thinking, these Pharisees and teachers of religious law, they're thinking, if he, even, if he knew who she was and her reputation, she, she would, he wouldn't let her touch him like that. Now, they didn't say that. They're thinking it. And Jesus responds to their thoughts and said, he said, who's going to forgive me more? Someone that's been forgiven of least or someone that's been forgiven of much? They said, much. And he's like, well, there she is. There she is. Isn't that interesting? So the law and those representing the law, listen, all they could do was hold up the standard but they didn't care about her, and there was nothing they could do to help her. In fact, listen, all they could do was condemn her. That's all they could do. And they did it, and they did it to the max, and they humiliated her, they embarrassed her, they shamed her, not just in front of Jesus, but in front of a crowd of people. Now, can you imagine that for a moment? Just put yourself there for a second. I mean, man, what a... What a, what, a, what a terrible moment. What a terrible situation. In fact, I can't really think of anybody in Scripture, in New Testament, that Jesus encountered. The only person that I could think that would be close to her was the maniac that was bound and, 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 and all that. that he, you know, he was just, and Jesus went across the lake to, to meet him. As far as a woman goes, but, but I think in some cases she was in a, a, a tougher place. I can't think of anybody who needed saving more than this lady. What I, what I sense as I just read between the lines and I ask the Holy Spirit to just help me as, as I read his word, like what, what's the deal here, you know? This lady's trapped. She, she's, in a, she's in a trap. She's trying to find a way to make a living. And she's in one of the oldest professions that's ever existed. And, and, and she's caught. And she's called. Now, I don't know where the guy was in this situation, right? He's missing. Isn't that interesting? You know? But that was her plight. That was her plight. And so we see the story. But here's, here's the second point we see. Jesus used righteousness as a standard for her judgment and was in himself qualified to judge her, but did not. So, so how did he respond to these Pharisees and teachers of religious law? We know the story. He said, hey, you know what? He, did, he didn't refute her. He didn't try to defend her and say she's not guilty. 
He didn't try to take up for her. He just said, he said, he didn't try to dismiss her. He wasn't trying to issue a, a, a presidential pardon. He just said, then you who were without sin, you go ahead and throw the first stone. And they, isn't it interesting that one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, in that order, they dropped their stones and walked away. Isn't that interesting? Why the oldest to the youngest? I don't really know, except for the fact maybe the older ones just had more sin in their life because they were older. They'd been sinning longer <laughs> than the younger ones. And so they, it hit them harder. And one by one, they walked away and they left her there. And Jesus sets a standard, though, here, right? And what was the standard that he used? He used the standard of righteousness to free her, to free her. He said, he who is without sin cast the first stone, and there was no possible way, not a single one of them, based on that standard, could pick up a stone and throw at her. And they knew it, and they walked away. Now, I don't know what he was writing in the dirt. And some say that dirt wasn't even dirt. It was cobblestone. Maybe it was. And for him to be writing in cobblestone, limestone, and that's, I've been over there. That's the way that the streets are and the colonnades are. It's stone. And, and if that were true, that would be a miracle right by itself, wouldn't it? I mean, that's like a superhero type of effect. He's, he's writing in hard stones. But it happened before. Listen, listen. When God took his finger and he wrote on stones of tablets those Ten Commandments, and what are they doing? They're judging her by the Ten Commandments. So in stones, he takes his finger and he's writing. And I don't know what he was writing. I don't think he was writing the Ten Commandments. I don't know. I, you know, I, I, I wondered, and I've, had, I've heard someone say it. Maybe he was writing their names, dot, dot, semicolon, and the sins in their lives. I don't know. I just know they didn't put up a fight. <laughs> they just turned and walked away. They didn't fight. They didn't argue about it, right? They didn't say, well, Jesus, but... They just dropped their stones one at a time from the oldest. And maybe he started with the oldest. Okay, Barney, Colin, well, you did this last week. You did this last week. You did this the week. And you were thinking this. Even if you didn't do that, you were thinking that on Tuesday. And he just went down the list one by one from the oldest to the youngest. I'm just what I'm guessing. I, I mean, I don't know. I really don't know. But I find that he was writing something. He was writing something. I think he wasn't writing something in the abstract. I think he was writing something that had to do with that moment, that was significant to the moment. I think he was writing something that was significant to the moment and played a part in each one of those dudes dropping that stone from the oldest to the youngest and walking away. Here's what I also know. Listen, they were judging her based on the law he judged, he flipped it, and he judged her based on righteousness. And he says, all right, you without sin, you cast the first stone. He didn't say, hey, nobody's going to touch her. He didn't say, hey, you got to go through me to, go to touch her. He didn't do one of those, right? He just said, all right, here you go. You without sin, you cast the first stone. Now, one by one, they dropped. Now, see, in doing that, you know what he did? He set a standard. He set a standard of righteousness. And the only one in that crowd, not just among those Pharisees and teachers of religious law, I'm talking about among that multitude of those people that were watching the show that day. Of all of those people, there was only one, by the standard he just set, there was only one person that was qualified to pick up a stone and throw it at that lady. And if that was the standard, he just went up one higher. He, 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 he trumped the law. He took the law here and he trumped it. He said righteousness instead of the law. And by that standard, he could have picked up those stones and thrown it at her. And, and it would have taken him a while, but he could have just stoned her to death one stone at the time. But he did. Not only did he not do it, it wasn't even in his mind. He wasn't even thinking that. That was never even in his heart. Listen to this. So the only one qualified to stone her didn't. Wow. That says something, doesn't it? You see, listen, they didn't stone her because they could not. He could, but he did not. Isn't that amazing? 
The only one. Now, what does that say? Is this just a, a cool story for the New Testament to fill up some, 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 some chapters and books that we can kind of read? No, this is, this is significant. There's something extremely powerful here. Again, she sets the standard. There's law as a standard. There's righteousness as a standard. But look, even in her, whole, her life is a, is a standard for what you don't want to be in that moment. Her, her life is a standard for where you don't want to find yourself in that moment. And, and again, aside from the maniac, I don't know of any other person that had a worse plot in that moment or lot in life than she did. Hers was bleak. It was bad. It was, it was horrible. But yet, he set a standard, and he himself met the standard and didn't stone her. Does that make sense? I mean, like, this is, this is more than just some, some words. This is, a, this is a picture for you and me. Now, I know it's not about us comparing ourselves with one another, right? Because, if, again, if you use the thought standard, we're all guilty, right? We're just guilty all the time. Because you, you, you don't even know. You can't even control what thought hits your mind. Sometimes, but you control what you do with it, right? But if that's the standard, and it is, but just aside from that, if you just take thought out of it, you say, just, just based on action, you know, there's maybe nobody in the room that was in a, as bad of a place as she was. Now, again, that should make us feel better because there, there's nothing about even our best that's good. I'm just saying, though. You know, I'm just saying, listen, if she's the standard for low, maybe you've never been that low. And I pray to God you never will be, right? And maybe you've never, that you never experienced anything on that low, lowness. There's plenty of people that are, though, right? But the key isn't even that. The key is, is the focus on the righteous one. And what did the righteous one do? How did the righteous one respond to this woman? In such an awful place, in such an awful moment, he said, he said to her, listen, here's what he said. He said to her, uh, verse 9, when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. And then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? And she replied, no, Lord, she said. She shocked. She was expecting to be stoned. No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. And then he said something else. You ready? Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Now, let me ask you something. Do you think from that moment on to the day she died, she never sinned again? Absolutely not. Isn't that interesting? So that wasn't a law he was giving her. You know what he was doing as he said that? He was giving her a gift. He gave her this gift called no condemnation. Listen, and in the beauty of this gift, he gave her an empowerment. And I don't think he was really saying to her, if we think of the word sin in the context of how it's usually defined in the Greek, it literally, sin means missing the mark. And we're going to all miss the mark at times. Missing the mark, and this is typically how sin is defined in the New Testament. Missing the mark means I aim for the bullseye, but I don't hit it. I hit a little low. I hit a little high. I hit it a little to the right or to the left, right? That's called missing the mark, you know? I don't think he, he, he had in mind that she would never miss the mark again. But I think what he's saying to her is, be free from this sin. Go and sin no more. I'm giving you the gift of condemnation so that this doesn't have to be your address. This doesn't have to be where you live. This doesn't have to be the life that you know. And he said, go and sin no more. Isn't that awesome? I think specifically he was referring to the sin that she was caught in. That sin that she was caught in in that moment and so embarrassed as she was thrown before that crowd, he said to her, he said this to her, he said, go and sin no more. Verse number, uh, point number three is what I wrote here. Through the gift of no condemnation, Jesus empowered her to live free, to live free. And I, I believe that that lady never returned back to that life that she had known just moments earlier. Isn't that interesting? 
So what's that got to do with you and me? What's that got to do with you and me? It goes to our key verse, and that's Galatians 5.1. And here's what it says. This is Paul writing. And this is the verse that just hit me. And I don't know, I guess I hear this every July 4th, around July 4th. And, but here's, here's the verse, Galatians 5.1, it says this. It says, it is for freedom. Paul writes this. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Isn't that awesome? Now, what's he talking about here? What's this slavery? What is this yoke? Well, if you continue to read the next 11 verses in Galatians chapter 5, he's dealing specifically with the law. And, and he's talking about circumcision and not circumcision, just different aspects of the law and what the law required one to do, right? And he's, he's basically telling them, listen, he's not saying don't, don't turn back to, to, to a yoke of sin. He's saying don't turn back to a yoke of slavery, which in context of this verse, of these verses, is dealing strictly with the law. In other words, Christ, listen to this. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free, so stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And he's referencing to the law. Isn't that interesting? That's all about the law. But here's two words that you see back to back. Think about this with me. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. For freedom, we have been made free. Like you see two words. You know, usually when you're writing a, a paragraph or you're writing something, you try not to use the same word in, in a sentence, right? I just use that word. You try to find another word that means the same thing, right? But here you see, you see the same word twice, freedom and free. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And free, you just add the D-O-M on the end of it. That constitutes, look at this, that constitutes a life. And the, and, the, and the word defined is the word liberty. Even in the Greek, it is the word liberty. So think about this with me. It is for liberty that Christ has set us free. What is he talking about here? What do you mean it is for freedom you have set us free? It is for liberty. It is for liberty. Here's what he means. It is for liberty. Not having to live your life according to the dictates of the law and the law standards and do's and don'ts. It is for freedom. It is, and, and that word, listen, and what is the opposite of that? The abundant life that we talk about, Jesus, as he talks about it in John 10.10. 10, as he says, the enemy comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. This freedom, it's a, it's, that, that represents this life of freedom. It's a state of freedom. Like kingdom or, or, you know, it's a state of kingship. This word freedom, it means a state of freedom, a state of liberty that God wants us to live in. And so it's, it, listen, it's for this state and lifestyle of freedom that Christ has set us free. He set us free from all of this so that we could enjoy and live in this. For freedom, he has set us free. Isn't that something? And you could say, he set us free to enjoy freedom. And, and maybe you think that's the same thing. But to me, it, the way it's written, it, it's powerful. He's saying for freedom, for this state of freedom, this lifestyle of freedom, he has set us free. And what is freedom? What's well, a little different for everybody? You know, I, I don't know what you need to be free from. I don't know what someone else needs to be free from. But whatever you need to be free from, freedom for you Looks like complete freedom and being free from that that has plagued you. For some, that may be guilt. Maybe guilt. Maybe shame. It may be, listen, it may be uh, negativity and negative thinking. Constant negative thinking. Worry, doubt, fear. Could be those things. Depression. It could be any number of things. And listen, and, we, and, and for every one of us, our battle's a little different, and they look a little different. But I promise you, if it doesn't come from God and it doesn't come from the kingdom of heaven, it's coming from your adversary. And, and although we may battle it and we may deal with it, that's not the place where God wants us to live because for freedom, He has set us free. He didn't set us free so that we would still worry about everything. He didn't set us free so that we would live in constant condemnation or guilt or, listen, or law-mindedness, 
Well, I can't do that, and I can't do that, and I can't do that, and I can't do that. He didn't say that. Does that sound like freedom to you? That's not freedom. There's nothing free about that. He is, listen, for freedom, he has set us free. For freedom, to enjoy this life of liberty and freedom. So that we could have that and enjoy that. Life to the full till it overflows. That's why he set us free. Isn't that awesome? That's amazing. And again, unlike what our founding fathers went through when they declared their independence and freedom, there was, a lot, there was, there was some years of fighting that had to happen. There was a lot of people that had to die to get to where they could actually enjoy what they declared. Listen, Jesus, when he walked into his hometown temple, he just started his earthly ministry. He had just recently been baptized by John the Baptist, and he goes back home for the weekend to see everybody, right? And as he gets home, he walks into the hometown synagogue, and they hand him the scrolls, and it just so happened. It was a custom thing that Jesus is just a good little boy in the neighborhood. Not Jesus Christ, the Messiah, but Jesus, how he's so good. He's just a model young man. Hey, Jesus is here. Let's give him the scroll like he used to do when he was little. Let him come up here and read from the scripture. And they did, and they handed it to him, and it was from Isaiah. And it just so happened to be his mission statement. And it was what the Father had sent him for. And he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And listen, and he has, he has anointed me to set captives free. To set at liberty those that are captive. To open up the eyes of the blind. And he went on with a litany of things that he had come to do. And, and listen, they're not just figurative. Some can say, well, that's just figurative stuff. He wanted to open up our spiritual eyes. Well, true. But he opened up blinded eyes too. Literally blinded eyes. For, for the next three and a half years, he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. And he did exactly everything he said he was going to do. And that declaration of independence that he opened up and read in front of his hometown temple. Isn't that amazing? He did it figuratively and he did it literally. He did it both ways. So, so, so we couldn't argue either one. Like, wow, that's amazing. And here's what he said. He said, listen, he said, he said I'm introducing and I'm paraphrasing the acceptable year of the Lord. Or the year, listen, or the age of God's grace and favor. You know what he said that day in the hometown temple? That was the declaration of independence that he read for us as believers. And he's saying, listen, the law is over, and you living by... This is me rolling out the scroll, if you didn't know. That's me rolling the scroll. He said, the law is over, and from now on, I'm going to set you free. And from now on, it's not about the law, but it's about God's grace and continuous favor. And grace means undeserved, unmerited favor and blessing from God. Not favor and blessing of God because you were really good at keeping the law. He said that era is completely over today. And it took him three and a half years and ended with his death on the cross and then his resurrection to bring that about for you and for me. And think about all that he went through after he made that declaration of our independence. Isn't that amazing? And everybody stood up and cheered and was happy. Not at all. The same folks in that hometown temple. Now, he grew up knowing all of his life because he grew up there in Nazareth. The Bible says that as he read the scripture, he folded up the scrolls or rolled the scrolls back up. And he sat down and that the eyes of all the people were upon him. So he sat somewhere up front, right? Because if he was sitting back there, y'all wouldn't be able to see him, right? So he was sitting somewhere up front. That's pretty obvious, right? Where did he sit? Well, many scholars believe that there were two seats in the temple that nobody ever sat in. One was for the coming Messiah, and one was for one of the prophets, Moses or Elijah, that they believe would come back from the dead in the end times and in the end days. And we still believe that will happen. But some scholars believe that Jesus actually sat down in the seat of the Messiah. Because the Spirit is the Lord, the Lord is upon me. He said, he said, he said and He's anointed me. And then He went through and He says, listen, He says, this scripture today has been revealed in your hearing. He's basically saying in His hometown synagogue, hometown church, right, that I am the Messiah you've been looking for. And scholars believe He sat down in the Messiah's seat. And they all stood up and cheered. No, they didn't. You know what they did? They got up and rushed to the front, grabbed him, and took him outside, drug him outside, 
and they tried to throw him off the edge of the cliff. You can read it. It's right in there, right? And the Bible says he escaped them. I don't know how he did that, but he got away. And he left the area. And then he went about to all the other towns and, and places and teached and preached the good news and did mighty miracles. Isn't that amazing? They turned on him that quick. Boom. Once he read his Declaration of Independence. Wow. And listen, that wasn't for him. Because he didn't need it. That was for you and for me. Because we did. That's amazing, isn't it? And here's what he's saying. He's saying this. It is for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. And don't let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. By a yoke of slavery. So what are you saying, man, that we're not supposed to do right or live right? Not at all. But you know what? By doing right and living right doesn't come by my motivation from the law. It comes from the love of Christ that's transformed my heart. That's what it comes from. And listen, I'm getting ready to read this, the key, and then we'll close. And here's the key to it. You ready? It's found in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes to shed abroad the love of Christ. That's what Paul says, in our hearts. That's one of the things he comes for. Listen to this. So what did Jesus say to her? He said, where are your accusers? They've left. He says, then neither do I condemn you. And listen, that would have been enough. If he just didn't stone her and he let her go, that would have been a plenty, right? But then he said to her, now you go and you sin no more. You're done with that. You go and you sin no more. Now listen, that's pre-Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit hadn't come yet, right? But Jesus knew that she'd have access to something and that someone, something was actually someone about three years later when the Holy Spirit would come on the day of Pentecost. Now you and I, listen to this, we have the benefit of the same Spirit of God living in us that raised Jesus from the dead. He now lives in us. And here's what Paul says that is the key to our victory now as believers. Here's how we go and sin no more. Now see, again, if you're thinking sin compared to her sin, you might be missing it because that might not be your sin. But here's how we go and worry no more. Here's how we go and we're not going to be depressed anymore. Here's how we go and we're going to walk in divine health from here on. Here's how we go and we do these things. And we live in this abundant life that Jesus came to give. How do we do it? We do it through the power of the Spirit. Galatians 5, I started out with Galatians 5.1. Now Galatians 5.18. All those verses prior to that was compared, uh, telling us how the law is not our answer. The law is not our answer. And now here's verse number 18, 5.18. He says this, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. This is the comparison. He's telling them, listen, don't, the, don't let the law guide your lives because the law can't do anything to help you. All it can do is point out your faults and your failures. Now here comes the answer and the contrast. He says, Galatians 5.18, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit, this is all capital S, and the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what, of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. And is that true or what? Our flesh is constantly warring with the Spirit. He says these two are constantly fighting one another. Verse 16 says this, verse 18. But when you are directed by the Spirit... You are not under the obligation of the law of Moses. In other words, if you choose, if I choose to live in and walk in the Spirit versus my flesh and the law, now I'm free from the law of Moses. I'm free from the law. And then he says this, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissension, division, even drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. He tried to cover them all because they're all in there, right? And one, that, one isn't greater than the other. They're just all bad, every one of them. 
Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living this sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. What's he saying? What's he saying to a believer? What do you mean you won't inherit the kingdom of God? I thought you said that I don't have to live perfect to go to heaven and that my sins have been forgiven. We have been and you are. But what is the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of God? Everywhere you see the phrase kingdom of God, it is God's way of doing and being. God's way of doing and being. And listen, if you're in God's kingdom and you follow God's way of doing and being, don't you know there's some benefits that come along with that? There's pleasures and there's joy from living in the kingdom. And we talk about living in the kingdom of God. So what is he saying? Those people that are, and, and Paul calls these people, he calls them carnal Christians. He says they're, they're just ruled by the dictates of their flesh. They, they don't have self-control. They're not living by the Holy Spirit. They're living by their flesh. And they're not going to enjoy, they're not going to get to inherit and enjoy the benefits that come with the kingdom of God. And that's sad. That's sad for us when we do that, right? But there's an answer to that. And what is the answer? The answer is found in the Holy Spirit. He says this in verse 27, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Here's what he produces. You ready? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Wow. That's awesome. Here's what he says. Those who belong to Christ have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and have crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. So what is Paul telling us? The secret, listen, to going and sinning no more is found in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's found in the power of the Spirit. And I, as a believer, I can choose if I'm going to walk in my flesh or if I'm going to walk in the Spirit. And, and oftentimes it's a moment-by-moment -moment choice. But I'll tell you, a good time to really get that party started is just first thing in the morning. When we wake up, it's like I'm reminded that I have a choice today. I can live a Johnny day, which could be okay, or it could be really bad. <laughs> or, or I can live a Jesus day filled with the Holy Spirit. Let him guide me and lead me. And listen, one is what I want to do maybe and what my flesh wants to do. And it starts right here in the heart and in my mind. And the other is letting the Holy Spirit lead me and guide me through the day. And I can promise you, and you know I'm telling the truth, there's a big difference in the two. At the end of one day, having let the Holy Spirit lead you, and, and I'm, are you saying you were perfect that day? You know what? Yes, because I've been perfected. I've been perfected. So whether I'm perfect or not in my, in, my th in my deed doesn't really matter because I've been perfected. In his eyes, I'm perfect because he sees me through the, through the prism of Jesus. And then, listen, and then walking in the Spirit. Listen, for freedom, he set us free. Walking in the Spirit, enjoying that life of the Spirit, that day in the Spirit. And it's a day-by-day -day thing. I wish I could tell you I could do this once and never do it again. And I, every day is a Spirit-filled day, and I'm just floating along. But it doesn't happen like that. You know, listen, Jesus makes it clear, and Paul makes it clear, that we crucify our flesh. How do you crucify your flesh? You tell your flesh, flesh, you ain't going to be in charge today. I, I, you know... I want to say it this way. I love you, but you ain't in charge. You know, I don't know if, you know if I love my flesh. I really don't. Because in my flesh, Paul says, in my flesh, there's no good thing. Paul battled this. He said, the things I want to do, I don't. The things I don't want to do, I do. Oh, wretched man that I am, what, what, is there any help for me? And then, then later, he begins, right in there, he begins to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. He's our answer. Listen, listen to this. For freedom, he has set us free. For freedom, he has set us free. Like if his goal was just to get that woman to heaven when all those Pharisees left and he pronounced righteousness on her, he gave her the gift of righteousness and no condemnation. If the goal was then to just get her to heaven, he would have beamed her up right in that moment. But see, she had a life to live after that. She had a story to tell. Listen, there would be a couple of things that she would still do that would be written about that we get to read to this day. There was an influence that she'd get to have on people's lives around her for the next so many years. 
And she got to do it. Isn't that amazing? All because, listen, she encountered the love and the grace of Jesus that gave her the gift of righteousness and the gift of no condemnation. That was a game changer. Now it makes sense why she burst in that room that day and washed his feet with her tears and her alabaster box and she dried them with her hair. Makes a lot of sense now. Why? Because he saved her from a lot. But listen, he didn't just save her from a lot. He saved her to a lot. And that's the part I think we often miss in Christian circles. Is we don't mind talking about what God saved us from. But we talk very little about what God has saved us to. He has saved us not only from hell and judgment. But he has saved us to this abundant life. And that's ours for the taking. And as Paul writes here, the key to it and the key to walking in it and enjoying it, and enjoying it is found in the help and the power of the Holy Spirit. And what does the Holy Spirit do? We've talked about this. He takes his super and he puts it on our natural. Wow, that's incredible. And, and listen, he's a difference maker. He's a difference maker. You know, Jesus wouldn't just give her or us this... I don't even want to use the word standard, but I can't think of a better one. He wouldn't just give us a standard without giving us a way to do it. And he has. And listen, the answer is not in the keeping of the law. Well, you got to wear your hair this short and you, you dress. you got to make sure it don't go below this level. And you got to make sure you don't go to the movies. I mean, I've heard all kinds of stuff growing up. Right? But none of that matters. None of, that is all hogwash. Because if, even if you follow every one of those little standards and you don't have the joy of the Lord in your heart and in your life, it means nothing. If you're doing it to conform to some man's rule book, it means absolutely nothing. And for freedom, you didn't, you didn't get set free for that. He said, for freedom, you've been set free. That's not freedom. There's no, free in the, there's no freedom in the law. Listen, but freedom is found in the Spirit. He says, listen, he said, these are the fruits of the Spirit. Listen to this. He says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. What does that say? That means I don't have to do anything. I just need to let him do it in me. But the, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. How does a fruit tree produce fruit? It's just connected. How does that branch way out there produce some fruit? Because it's connected to the main trunk, and the trunk's connected to the roots, and it's grounded, been planted. That's how we do it. And the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. I'm about to read it to you one more time, and all of this stuff just comes out of us as we walk in the Spirit. You know what my only choice for the day really is? You ready for this? Whether I'm going to choose to walk in the Spirit for that day so that I can enjoy the freedom he has set me free for. That's my big choice right there. And if I'll get a jump on that before my flesh gets too woke, then I'm a lot better off. Like, like right out of the way, your alarm clock goes off, you're headed to the coffee pot. My routine is I get out, I turn the coffee pot on so it's ready. When I get out of the shower, I can put my pot in there and make my coffee. But on that journey from, from one to the other and into the restroom, I can begin to say, Lord, help me this day. There's things on my to-do list I've been procrastinating on. I'm the only one too, aren't I? Right? Listen, there's things I need to say and do. There's some things you put on my heart to do today, and I just haven't done it. So, you know what? I want you to do it through me, Holy Spirit. I invite you to come and just fill me right now. Guide me through this day. Lead me through this day. I literally had a thought this morning. I'm not kidding you. I literally had a thought this morning as I'm getting ready. And it was a thought that began to stress me out about something that I got to do coming up. And I'm not kidding you. As I'm, as I'm thinking that thought, I can literally feel the back muscles under my lower right back begin to tighten up and draw up in my, in my right back. Isn't that interesting? I could literally feel it happening in that moment. Listen, that's not the freedom he set me free from. So you know what I begin to do? And it hadn't completely gone all the way yet, but it's getting better. On my way in here, I'm just praying, and I'm thanking the Lord. And I'm like, Lord, I'm going to cast all of that care on you right now. 
a fresh start, a clean slate you give me. Your mercies are new every morning. So right now, Father, I just cast all that care on you because I know you care for me. I give it to you, and I'm asking you to guide me. And I literally could feel an ease coming over me. Isn't that amazing? It's just that simple. It's just that simple. John 8, 36 says this. It's our last verse in closing. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. You shall be free indeed. Now, here's the truth. The Son has set every one of us free. It has already happened. Now, the choice is ours if we choose to walk in it. But for freedom, he has set us free. And he says, listen, I'm setting you free not to go get tangled up anymore in the dictates of the law. But I'm setting you free to enjoy this abundant life. And if you live a life by the Spirit, these are the fruits that are going to automatically come out of you. And if these fruits are coming out of you, that means the other ones aren't. So I don't have to focus on what not to do. I just need to focus on letting the Spirit fill me because He's going to lead me in what I need to do. And it's just that simple. I don't have to focus on keeping the law. I just focus on the righteousness that I've been given. And I let the Holy Spirit lead me and guide me and direct me. Isn't that amazing? Think about that lady. Thinking about that lady. Don't you love how God can turn situations and circumstances around? Worst possible situation, worst possible moment and circumstance that she finds herself in. And yet Jesus sets her free and she still has life to live. There's still some things that God wants to do in her life to use her. And again, that story of her bursting in that house, this is what Jesus said. And I'm paraphrasing. As, as long as the earth remains, as long as it is written and told, this story of her doing this must be told. And listen, not every story. There are a handful of stories that are written in every gospel account, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and that's one of them right there. That's one of them right there. Isn't that amazing? You see, listen, as we walk in our freedom... In Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of it is going to happen, that God's going to use your life to influence someone around you. Isn't that interesting? Chris and Ray did a great job today. And as you notice, Courtney's not here, and Joel and Faith and gave her the day off today. She just finished ten and a half months of hair school. Alexander Paul Institute, she, she finished up on Friday, finished up at 11. And it was like an intense 10 and a half months for her. I watched her go through this from start to finish, right? I remember telling her, like I'm giving her some good dad advice starting out. And, and, and she's, she's like, she's, she's starting to believe it's like really legit, you know? I mean, like she started a job a year or so ago. And I told her, I said, you take initiative in that job. And you'll be their go-to person. And she did exactly what I told her to do. I said, like, when there's nothing going on, you find something to do. Wipe counters down. You just be doing stuff. And she did it. And they promoted her to a supervisor in this, little, in this store, right? Wow, that's okay. Then she starts school. I said, now, Courtney, you got to be there for ten and a half months. Here's what you want to do. Make the decision that you're going to enjoy it. You're going to enjoy it. And she said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And she finished at the top of her class. This is a dad bragging there. Are you ready? Finished at the top of her class. And the first one to graduate in her class. And she finished up Friday. And I was thinking about it because she was tired. Literally, she's like for the last few weeks, she's just she's been transparent with me. And it's okay if we're like that. She's like, Dad, I'm so tired. I'm so ready to be done with this school. I'm just like, I just like if this thing lasted two more weeks, I don't know if I could do it. She was that tired of it, you know. And I get it because her day was from 9 in the morning till 530 in the evening. Five days a week, right? And I was doing the math. I was thinking, like, what does that equal for a college student? Like, getting a degree? And I'm thinking, it's got to, that's got to be close to a four-year degree, like, in these ten and a half months. And I was talking to one of the instructors. She said, it's actually more hours than they put in for a college, four-year college degree they do in ten and a half months in this program. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. And here's what I told her. I told her this the other week. We were chatting. I said, Courtney... There's some girls in that class that you don't even think like you. I said, but I promise you, you've made an influence on some of their lives. 
And she just kind of downplayed, well, I don't know about that. I'm not, I, you know, I don't know about that. And then Friday I watched, I watched it as the instructor gathers them up and they're lined up facing one another like they're going to do this bridge thing. And they're video, I'm videoing the thing and the, and the instructor, watches, as she goes and clocks out for the very last time because it keeps record of all of her hours, right? And as she turns to go through, they're walking through this tunnel. She walks through this tunnel and everybody's cheering for her, her last day. Girls are crying. I'm watching girls crying. And I heard several girls say, Courtney, I really love you. You know? And we left. And, and, and I said, Courtney, there were some girls in that line crying for you and over you and, and telling you they love you. And I said, I bet it surprised you, didn't it? She said, it did. I said, because you didn't even realize. Just going in there, living in the Spirit. Living your life, your little old self in the Spirit. Just doing your thing. How much of an impact you'd have. On these girls, I've two of them came to a little graduation party we had for Friday night, and they talked about how much of a light she was in that place. Now, I'm not just bragging on her. That could be any of us. But here's what I'm saying. Listen, here's what I'm saying. Just a little bit of the Holy Spirit in these days and times can make a big difference in the world around us. You don't even have to have a big light because it's so dark out there right now. Just your little light will do a whole lot of shining. Isn't that amazing? So here's what we do. We just bask in the knowledge that for freedom, he has set us free. For a life of freedom. And just check yourself every once in a while. I hope you don't get that knot in your back. But if you get one in your stomach because you're worried about something or there's something going on, just check it. You know what? That is not the freedom that he set me free from and for. So you just... You just have a little talk with Jesus. Listen, I love that. You just come just as I am without one plea. And we can. This morning I'm pulling the trailer coming here, and I just had one of those just as I am meetings with the Lord. Oh, Lord, I just come just as I am, and I need you to help me. I don't want to worry about this. This isn't what, this isn't what you've given me. And you know what? What I'm worried about probably even a, when I get there and do what i got to do, I'll look back on it and think, why did I worry? Isn't that usually what happens? Anyway, and the whole time, look, the enemy's trying to steal, kill, and destroy, rob us of this life and this abundant life, all through lies and just impressions and, and thoughts that come from the adversary. You know why? Because he don't care about us. He don't care about us. You know what? He's after Jesus. See, they didn't care about her. They were after Jesus. Isn't that something? He don't care about us. He's after Jesus. What do you mean he's after Jesus? Listen, he doesn't want Jesus to be glorified through our lives. And if he can bind us up and knot us up and worry and fear and all kinds of mess, then our light doesn't shine. But when we let the Holy Spirit fill us and guide us, listen, then we get to enjoy the freedom that he set us free for. Isn't that awesome? And it all happens through Jesus. Let's stand to our feet this morning. Hallelujah. Ray, would y'all play that Just As I Am song again? While we... Take our communion together this morning. Thank you. I want you all to play that. If you're missing a communion cup, if you had not got one yet, lift your hand up and our guys will get those to you. Hallelujah. Hop right in there. Hop right in there. We're going to receive communion together. And this is how we do it. This is our invitation. You know what I love about this invitation? It's not an invitation that you got to do anything. The invitation is just for you and me to receive, to receive. And I love that. Jesus invited us to a table. And, he, and, and there's that story of that in the scripture where he tells, he tells them to go out and, 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 and he get, he's given this parable. And he tells them in the parable they're to go out and invite people. And there were people busy. They were burdened with loads of care. And he said, well, you know what? Just go out to the highways and byways and compel everybody to come. He said, I want them to come to my table. And this is what he gives us right here. It's a feast at a table. It looks kind of small. But listen, it's huge and it's significant. And when taken in faith, listen, when taken in faith, when this is mixed with our faith, Paul said it did them no good because it wasn't, they didn't mix it with their faith. When we mix this with our faith and we say, this is more than just some cracker and some juice, 
This represents the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. And that's why he gave it. He gave it as a reminder. He says, as often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. So when I do this today, you know what I'm doing? I'm reminding myself for freedom I've been set free. Not for, not for, not for living in a knot and, and cares of this world, worry me and, and sin and, 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 and weight or anything. None of that's for me. For freedom he set me free. So today, in Jesus' name, through the body and the blood of Jesus, we receive that empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We receive afresh and anew that free gift of salvation for whatever needs saving in our lives. If that's your soul, you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you won't be able to pray this and do this without being saved when it's all said and done. If you mix it with your faith. Paul says, listen, he says, believe it in your heart and just say it with your mouth and you shall be saved. That's what we do today. Amen. Hey, listen, as we do this, whatever your care might be, Whatever that thing that could be robbing you of that freedom that he set you free for, in Jesus' name, then we say you're free from that. You, you're, you're free from that. In Je- you are free to enjoy this abundant life that Jesus came to give you. Amen? Let's make this declaration of our faith. Father, we just thank you today that Jesus, the Son of God, died on the cross to save us from our sin. And to save us to this abundant life. We believe that. We declare that. And today, Father, we come just as I am. Without one plea. Father, that lady, she came just as she was. She didn't come willfully, but she was thrown down just as she was. In the filth of of who she was in that moment in her life. And you set her free. And Father, just like that today, you have set every one of us free. But not just free from, but for freedom. This life of freedom, you have set us free. So today, Father, we receive that afresh and anew. Today, we remind ourselves through the body and the blood of Jesus that we are the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. And Father, we say goodbye today to worry and fear and sin and transgression and anything that would try to hold us back or hold us down in Jesus' name. We cast every care upon you because we know you care for us. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to fill us right now from the top of our heads to the soles of our feet. Fill us, Holy Spirit, through and through so that there's nothing left of us and it's all of you. Fill us now, we pray, in Jesus' name. And we receive this by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Now receive that if you will.